Hello everyone and welcome to This Nintendo Life episode 268. My name is NBZ um, and you know I mean considering the fucking week I've had Bally we might as well call it This Balatro Life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, because it's NBZ and Balatro. I that has been, Bally. It has been my life for the last week. Well for the last like four days at least um, and uh yeah, things have things have gone absolutely insane. I think I think your new sub name on Discord should be MBZ Publisher Extraordinaire. Yeah, yeah, I that's guess like so. Where you are, that's where you're at now. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, that's me. Just made it to the top of the mountain. Um, <laughs> I should I should say Balatro. That is the company line. That is the way it's supposed to be said. Um, so must be pronounced as Balatro. Uh, if you've not heard about it, it's a it's a hit <laughs> indie game. Uh, you know, sold two hundred fifty thousand copies in three days. Um, found by some guy on the internet. I uh, don't know who he, who that guy <laughs> is, but apparently made a good decision because this game seems to be made a very good decision. Yeah, it seems like this game is being played by a lot of people. Um, so yeah, uh, hi Bali, how are you doing? I I'm good. I just want to say a huge congrats because thank you. I think that it's it was so exciting when you first got this job. Yeah, and then I feel like everything that you've achieved in this job and the places that you've gone. Everything uh-huh. has just been like this eye-opening, incredible. Oh my god, this is the, like this is never going to happen again. And oh my god, like this right. is all the new thing. And going to LA and going uh-huh. to Gamescom and like all these big things and the success you've had with like Case of the Golden Idol yeah. and numerous other games. But then for a game like Balatro, Balatro, sorry, uh-huh. to come along and just kind of take everything that you've done to a new height, I think it's really awesome. So big yeah. congrats. Thank you. It is fucking surreal <laughs> i'm just gonna be honest about it like i don't believe that uh it, that what's happened has happened uh um, yeah but um but yeah hey it's it's a it's a game on nintendo you know look at that you can play it on your nintendo switch by the way nintendo switch version of this game touch great like you can use the touch screen and the touch screen works really well um i was playing it before launch um and uh i was just in bed and i was just like using the touch screen to play and i'm like wow this works this much great like not a lot of games use the touchscreen on switch so uh, if you do want to play it on switch then uh, you can do that and it's um it's it's one of those i would recommend uh, setting aside some time because seemingly it is a time vampire and will take away your time because uh, a lot of people have been reporting very high hour counts and staying up until 3 a.m uh, playing it um if you don't know what the game is it's a poker roguelike so it's a it's a roguelike uh, in the vein of other deck building games um but is based on the rules of poker i would say you don't need to know how to play poker. The game does a good job. You're not actually playing poker. You're no. providing poker hands. Exactly. You're using poker hands. Um, the developer has talked about this in interviews, but the idea for the game wasn't originally based on poker. It was, it's based on a game called Big Two, um, which is a different game um, that uses poker hands as part of it, as part oh. of its rule set. Um, but uh, he thought the poker theming would be a good kind of way to get people uh, more into it, right? Because it's more familiar to more people. Um and yeah, so if 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 it's if it's a genre that you're into, uh, then I think it's going to be one that people will be interested in checking out. Um, but uh, but yeah, I um I, we're basically going to have a policy here of like if Bali wants to play one of the games that I've published on the show and wants to talk about it on the show, my policy is that I just I'm going to shut up and not say anything basically um, because <laughs> I think like it's a bit of a conflict of interest. Like, of right. course, I'm going to say it's the best game ever because I was involved in publishing it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, just from just from a show perspective, it's like it's that weird thing, right, where i think it's coming up more and more now as we see as i see like every single outlet that i follow being sponsored by final fantasy 7 and then subsequently reviewing final fantasy 7 i'm like just feels a bit weird um so i thought we just put a policy in place um of like hey you can you can listen to my word about it which is to say go buy it it's available (laughs) right now uh or uh, or i could just not say anything and bali could give his thoughts if he so chooses to yeah and 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 i think play stack published games etc we'll, we'll never cover in kind of game of the year lists and no go tt no. dakotis and these these lists and things we'll just keep it entirely separate because yeah it's just yeah. conflict of interest so. yeah totally yeah um so uh that said uh bali what are we going to be talking about on the show uh for the first segment we're going to talk about the games that we have been playing and then for the second segment um phil spencer tried to stop it but you know nintendo managed to get their um their direct out there it was in a partner showcase so yes a little less high profile but there's a lot of good stuff in there that we want to talk about 
Yeah, um, and that partner showcase dropped in the middle of this game being on fire, and um, and I I said to Bali before this, I basically didn't remember anything that happened because I watched <laughs> it in like a haze after being in a meeting, and then forgot instantly what happened, and then rewatched it uh, before this. So uh, I think I have a better idea now of what was there because I I totally missed that. Apparently, Endless Ocean Luminous, whatever it's called, has like thirty player online multiplayer. I was like, what? Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I, I totally missed that uh, when I was watching it live, but. Um, Anyway, uh, let's get into the games we've been playing. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll shut up. Bally, do you want to talk about <laughs> Balatro? Because uh, you played a little bit of it. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about Balatro. Um, so I play, I've played about only two to three hours, which is probably a lot less than the vast majority of people out there who have played this game and love this game. And I, I do really like this game. I think it is really, really great. I think thing... So I'm a quite a big poker fan. In the past, I've played quite a bit of poker just with like friends mainly texas hold'em and just small amounts of money and having a really good time with a bit of poker so i do know my poker hands and i i'm fairly warm on roguelikes i think i've played a decent number now and i think the combination of like poker hands with a roguelike was something that broadly appeals to me uh i think there's it's a decently steep learning curve where you feel like right i i you initially win some hands with some very traditional poker hands and and things quickly go incredibly wild when you start having the ability this is something i love in deck builders and i, I come from like a board game deck building background where i love games like dominion where there's cards in that game where you trash cards and trashing cards makes your deck smaller and making a deck smaller is ultimately the most important thing about deck building because it allows you to access the cards that you want faster and that's always a strategy i've had with slay the spire and similar in this game blatro that's what i was trying to do with some of my runs and like being like right if i'm going for flushes i'm now going to get rid of well flush is a bad example i guess but yeah no it's a good example because you can get like get rid of the clubs in order to maximize hearts or diamonds or spades and you'd be like right if i get rid of all the club cards in this deck i can then access these other cards to get flushes more easily and this kind of thing and i like that you can just you have that diversity of burning cards adding different jokers or different multipliers different things and additional things that the joker then multiplies by I love that aspect and then just other cards like like stone cards and glass cards and I, I'm still fully trying to understand how to utilize those specific cards well but I get the broad idea um, so I've, I've been on like a decent few runs and I don't think I've gotten particularly far but what I really like about this game is I don't like roguelikes where you're in the middle of a run, things are starting to go south and you kind of limp on for like 10, 15, 20 minutes and then you end your run and you think, oh, well, I kind of knew this run was going to end long before it actually ended. Uh, and what I like about Balotro is things end very abruptly. Like either you're going to nail it and all your multipliers pull off or you know you've, you've run out of discards you don't match the score and your run is over i i like that there's like this abruptness to write game over let's do a new run and i feel like some roguelikes i've played are a little bit slower on the the outs as it were uh so yeah it's really cool i get why there's all this hype i wouldn't say i'm in the top echelon of the Balatro hardcore but i want to play more of this game this year i'm having a really good time and yeah big fan big fan so I think that probably summarizes my few hours of Balatro. If you want to come back in, then cool. and I know I've swapped yeah. between Balatro and Balatro about four <laughs> times in my I mean, discussion. Look, but um, we were talking about this before. But like every podcast I've listened to has called it seventeen different names. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you're not alone. We we should just call it Balitro. You know, Balitro. Just, uh, just, it's replaced just, the art of Bali. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. No, right. Time to make a Balitro uh, emoji for the Discord. It's my so. face with like a Joker hat on. Yeah, absolutely. Like yes. Yeah. Oh my god, I need to fucking paint you in clown <laughs> makeup now um yeah that's great um awesome well uh Bally, i know that you've been playing another roguelike that in some ways is getting some comparisons to uh Balatro as well yeah um uh i guess because of like big number go up big right? number goes up feels good uh, yeah yes. uh, i've been playing vampire survivors on game pass you know we're in this kind of pre final fantasy 7 rebirth period and i wanted to jump into a few things before i didn't want to jump into anything huge that would send me away off on, off on something although i have sunk a ridiculous amount of time into like forza motorsport recently 
But aside to that, I've been playing Vampire Survivors. I've played about maybe five to six hours. Um, I really like Vampire Survivors. Yeah. I think I think that it's likewise about Balatro. It, things end incredibly abruptly in Vampire Survivors. Like you can be absolutely nailing it on a run, and some enemy just comes along and destroys you. Right. And they destroy you so fast, you you don't even have time to blink. And I find that there was one run of Vampire Survivors where I was like enjoying a run, feeling very confident. And I think I just looked at something else going on in the living room that I was in playing the game. And when I looked back at the screen, I was dead. And I was like, oh, well, that was stupid. Like, this is not a good game. You have to really focus. And here's a really weird comparison I have with Vampire Survivors. So I'm a big follower of the game of rugby i love rugby for americans who don't understand rugby it's like american football without the, all the shoulder pads, it's like what if but... american football was good actually right exactly <laughs> no shoulder pads etc but what so this is hard to explain but in rugby you're taught to always run at a soft shoulder and what i mean by that is you will run at a line of defense and there will be gaps in the defense and if you run straight at a player, they're going to get a mu- they're much more likely to get a dominant tackle on you, and they will drive you back. Whereas the aim in rugby is to always keep going forward. So if you find what's called a soft shoulder, so if you run into a gap and a player moves over to that gap, and you keep driving your legs, they're going to tackle you more weakly than if they had head on, as it mm. were. So as a result, you can then advance. And I constantly find vampire survivors. <laughs> is like finding soft shoulders. You're constantly finding soft shoulders of all these enemies because if you take them on head on, you will they will likely get through through your defenses, do damage to you and you'll die. But if you are constantly running into space and finding soft shoulders as it were and a- a- attacking enemies round the side as it were and attacking them you have waves of, you know, ammo, ammunition coming out of you. If you can angle yourself around an enemy so they've taken more ammunition and it obviously depends what 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 build you have at the time obviously but the way that when you can find those spaces and effectively manipulate your way around enemies it feels like a game of rugby where you're trying to just find look for space basically is what i'm trying to say um right and yeah it's it's great it i i think it's really cool I, i i think the flaw i'm having with it is I don't love how secret and weird all the unlocks are. Mm. Um, I've heard it's incredibly difficult to ever defeat the Reaper and do all these things. And I, I think there's like a lot of hoops you have to jump through in order to do that. And it's all a bit secretive and a lot of the guides online feel quite complex. And it's not what's what kind of is in one way the most straightforward game is also quite a complex game at the same time. Because there's a whole lot of numbers in the background doing a whole lot of work and it's i'm not saying you ever have to engage with those numbers but you do definitely have to understand the builds quite meticulously if you want to defeat the reaper that comes in at like 30 minutes right so i think that aspect is a little frustrating i think for me i i remember like playing a lot of it and it was mainly just i wanted to keep going until i figured out what all the weapon evolutions were and then kind of once i did that and once I'd unlocked a good number of characters, I did feel like, oh, I'm kind of done with this game now. Yeah. I didn't feel like I had a need. I think I played 17, 18 hours of Vampire Survivors, and that's like, you know, three runs a night for like a couple of weeks, right? And then right. played it over Christmas and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, I put a good amount of time into it, but um, I know people who put in hundreds of hours, and when you do that, it's basically you are tackling every single thing. You are trying to find all these points on the map. You are trying to basically unlock every aspect of the game and at that point you then find out a lot of weird stuff and i know there is lots of weird stuff that can happen with vampire survivors and i've never experienced any of it so it is that kind of nice thing of one day i might just go back to it and and figure out what to do with that stuff Mm. but um but yeah it is it is just like a perfect brainless like podcast game where you just podcast you just all your focus is just literally move it is it's crazy how the stick is the only thing you have to use in that game right yeah um, that is w- and, wild and and yet it is still so engaging despite that being the fact despite that the only input you have is to move your character around the screen there are so many decisions you are making like you said at every moment of where do you move to what space is safe what 
kind of thing are you are you going to keep moving across the map in order to get to this point that you see at the expense of gems because if you don't there's this kind of power curve right if you don't keep up the curve of collecting gems then you won't have enough experience to level up and then gain power-ups and weapon evolutions yeah. and all this stuff so you have to you have to manage your curve of power with your desire for exploration of the space and i think mm. it creates this really interesting tension um and often leads to runs where sometimes you're like like i remember i wanted to get an item on the map and i was like i'm not gonna actually do this run properly i'm basically just gonna run all the way there try and survive get to this thing to unlock it and then i'll probably just die instantly and that'll be the end of the run but my purpose there was to do that as opposed to right. survive and level up and get weapon evolutions or find some secret thing that was going on to unlock some character um so yeah and it's that i think to what i was saying before i kind of would have liked my ideal roguelike is hades because it has a credits it has a story it has you basically have to beat uh, hades 10 times to see the credits and i like that i like that i like games that have a clear structure and when you beat it this is this is what happens and you defeat the main game and then the credits roll and i do really struggle like you were saying with vampire survivors emmy said you're like right well now that i've got all the kind of weapon evolutions and the characters and the stages i kind of feel like i've done enough i'm bad i'm really bad at myself like at judging when should i call it a day as it were i like right. it when the game tells me when the day is done is it? <laughs> how like, do i, I know like what i'm done you know it's like yeah. that um yeah I, I can't remember what it was in reference to but someone was like it, it was a reddit thread and someone was like you, you play it until you're satisfied and the guy's like how do i know when i'm satisfied i, <laughs> I think that i'm kind so of like... bad at knowing that yeah um, yeah and i think with the nature of playing games for the show often seeing those credits and getting to an end point and the satisfaction is, is sometimes getting to the end more so than always the gameplay and that sounds really mm. bad but there's yes. a real satisfaction often there's a narrative resolution or something that i'm getting to and if the point before that is not as great it's made up by the resolution or, or, i don't know but yeah yeah i do i do like a a, a clear cutout and that's mm. what i struggle with this game and that's my personal taste that's not a, a dig at the game to be fair it's more just i, I do like games that have a clear structure and a clear end a cl and a clear main game end i should say because i'm all for roguelikes having a bajillion combinations and options for for past credits like hades right. but i i do like when these games try to have like okay we're gonna have a type of player that is like bally and uh -huh. they just like a main game and it ends with a credit and i i would i've liked vampire survivors to have come closer to that um and yeah i i, I should say my best run was i think i sent you at mbz i got to 32 minutes and apparently after 30 minutes a reaper arrives every minute and I, the third reaper killed me so i managed to hold off two reapers without killing them annoyingly but um with like i had like the time stop thing that's and, the thing that i think you need in order to kill them basically right. and then i also had the supposed most powerful weapon in the game which is like the blue water evolved um i can't oh. remember what it's called um but the thing about the blue water is that it it it's very random in the way that it falls on the screen. So you very yes. much need a solid build beyond just having right. the blue water. Yeah. Otherwise, gaps will form. Um, what are your uh, go-to weapons? What is the thing that you're rolling with the most? Oh, I like... Now I like the blue water. I like the pausing of enemies. I do like the garlic, although I will say that incredible run I did was garlic-free okay um and i really like the bibles that spin around you uh and i really like i like the homing in magic the blue homing oh in magic. yeah very yeah, yeah, simple yeah. but um that gets more powerful what about you yeah i mean i i think axes were pretty solid axes and a whip um i did like that as kind of a both of those are very directional um yes. focused and i mm -hmm. generally liked the weapons that were quite not necessarily they random just happen. But, but just happen and mm -hmm. were all around you or the like the knives that go straight out in front knives of you. are good oh I my god so a lot. actually i think my favorite evolution is the knives evolution where it's just like a thousand knives just shooting out of you yeah that one is very satisfying i had that on my 32 minute run as well actually um yeah it was really good 
Um, yeah, because whatever direction you face then, you can almost create a corridor for yourself in order to get out of situations. So I found that when the fucking crazy knives happened, that definitely uh, helped me yeah. quite a bit. So, yeah. yeah. Um, um, I don't know how much more time I will spend with this game. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy a run here and there. Some runs end incredibly abruptly and you've, you've just cocked up and it's like, right, well, that was something that wasn't yeah. very fun. But yeah. Um, and I like how there is the gradual, the roguelite element where you are gradually improving your character with the money you're gaining. Like yeah, I like yeah. that. And stuff like gaining an extra, um, like an extra dagger, an extra piece of ammo for every build. I really like that power up. So I've done that. Yes. And I tend to use the character that also gives you a plus one. So I've got plus three of, or well, plus two, three total. Uh, at the start of a run with that with that guy I've forgotten his name he's like in the top right of the, all the characters um mm. so yeah it, it's a really cool game i like i said rebirth is around the corner uh that's my focus probably so just like digging into some things you can bump in and out of right now yeah and yeah. and i'm kind of trying to wrap up forces career mode which is quite oh. long oh um, okay yeah, i thought you were so, just playing forces just for fun just i kind of was yeah. and then i got a bit hooked and oh. maybe supplanted vampire survivors a little bit oh, okay so, that makes sense yeah. um but i did have a really good five hours and i might come back a little bit but yeah um i'm really glad to have played it it was yes. game on game pass i've been sitting there a while that i've been meaning to get to and this is the year that i've told myself i'm going to play a bunch of great indies over the last few years so and um, it's another one that i would say is pretty great um yeah good yeah. to take something off the list um definitely good stuff um cool uh well i've had an interesting week of playing games in that i didn't play any i think this is the least amount of games i've played in maybe a decade like this entire week i've not that played aren't any. Balotro. I haven't even played that. Yeah, like, you've I, just I been following stats about it. I, it is so, like literally every day is like all I do after work is go to reset era, go to YouTube, go to Twitter, <laughs> go to. And the, here's the problem with having a successful game is that everybody is talking about it constantly, and you will never run out of things to look at. Yeah, you will never yeah. run out, and that's the dangerous thing about it. Um, but I think like during a week like this when it's just gone crazy, I, I forgive myself for doing that. I think it's. Uh, it's very hard to get your brain into a, a different uh, space uh, when, when mm -hmm. something goes looks crazy like that. But um, but uh, thankfully, I was smart and I played video games before this week, so I'd have uh -huh. stuff to talk about. Um, so, yeah, as I've talked about before, I, I tend to like having a game before bed that is a... I don't have a story associated with this game. This is just a gameplay-focused game that I listen to podcasts in the last half hour before I go to sleep. Um, and recently... Uh, on my Steam Deck, that was Hoa. That was my previous one. Uh, and I decided, let's go into some emulation stuff because Steam Deck has all that stuff. I have it set up and I have some fun things on there. And um, on a whim, I decided to boot up Donkey Kong King of Swing. Um, so for those who don't know, this was a Game Boy Advance game um, that I remember seeing in magazines a little bit. And like, I don't remember too much about fun it. Fun art back style. Then. Fun art style, quite nice, and it looks really good on Steam Deck, like a very popping visual, and um, yeah, it's, it's got some good colors to it. Um, it's it's very bright, and it has a, I don't know, it's 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 got that Game Boy Advance chunky pixel uh, look to it. Um, it's just, it, it's a really nice looking game. Um, but the premise behind this game is essentially, what if you controlled Donkey Kong with the shoulder buttons, and what you would do is you would hang on to these kind of like, I say, I guess they're pins in a sense. They're these kind of circular handhelds that are kind of floating in space. Um, and you hold on to it with. So if you hold on the R button, Donkey Kong will grab this thing and he will start spinning in a circle. And clockwise you, or anti clockwise? Uh, if you're holding with your right hand, then it would be going clockwise. But yes. then you can use your left hand to grab another hand, handhold and he starts spinning anti clockwise um, in the other direction. And if you hold both of your hands on two handhelds at once, you start charging up and he goes red. And if you let go, he kind of springs up into the air. So it's quite simple from a control standpoint because so you can move when he's on the ground and when he's in the air, you can use the, the stick or the D-pad to move him left and right. But in order to grab onto objects, you have to use the shoulder buttons to do so. Um, and after playing this, I, I kind of thought about it. I'm like, this, this was kind of like getting over it with Bennett Foddy or Only Up or any of these like games where 
the entire purpose of it was is like streamer rage bait where like they try and climb this thing for ages and ages and takes them two hours and then they just eventually fail at it and fall to the ground again it's it's kind of that in a way um but i think it's not intending to be that um so i, I think this game is super interesting and it actually has a, a is it levels or high score it's level so right. you basically you start out and it's like king k rule he stole all the bananas of course because that's what donkey kong stories that are bastard. um and yeah and you uh you basically have i think it's five worlds and each world has four levels and a boss um so it's you got bosses it has bosses so you enter That's the cool. you enter the level and the level is composed of three stages so the first stage you go up to the top and you hit a uh, platform and it has like an arrow going to the right and then you exit that and you basically enter a new screen so it's essentially three screens back to back to create one level um is the way that it's set up and it starts off very simple where it's like okay uh, here are these giant squares and there's loads of handholds and you're going to grab onto them easily and you're not going to miss any and hey go collect some bananas and there's a bunch of bananas to collect um bananas are interesting because you use them for two purposes so you have three health in this game and it's pretty brutal because you have to get through all three of those stages with just three health um and games back in the they were hard they were fucking hard man they did not hold back um and there's no checkpoint or anything so if you die if you die at the very end of the third part of a level guess what bud you're starting the whole level again from the beginning you got safe states or something oh oh, 100 okay look mate here's the truth it's kind of like mario pinball when i talked about that if i had played this as a child i would have got so fucking annoyed i would have thrown this game out the window i would have been frustrated i would never have beaten it um i would have got barely anywhere in it um but thanks to the magic of save states i can actually enjoy the game which is which is kind of nice so um you know every time i got to like a part of a stage uh, i would then give myself a save state uh, and be able to like load it back if i fell down or something stupid happened i lost all my lives but bananas are used for two purposes so you can refill your health with bananas i think it costs 10 bananas to give yourself an extra heart and then you also have an invincibility option so if you press the other button on the gba it's either a or b i can't remember which is which but one of them is to give yourself health back one of them is to turn invincible and so you go invincible for like maybe 10 seconds and that costs 20 bananas so these bananas you're collecting it's good because you're building up currency that you can then use to either go invincible and do damage to enemies or to give yourself health to heal yourself back up um and yeah it starts very simple and you're collecting bananas and you're going up high and you're getting in barrels and stuff like that and it's shooting you up um and then they start to introduce enemies and the way that you deal with enemies is like i said before when you when you're holding on to two of these handhelds at once you're tension builds in your arms and you start going red and you then release them and donkey kong kind of does a he does a jump but it's like a roll as well so he basically like springs himself up and if you hit an enemy while you do that you can kill that enemy so Mm. that's kind of how it works is you kind of you're positioning yourself real push your luck kind of yeah you're positioning yourself and it's it's fun because there's momentum to it so like the way you get up higher is you like you start swinging with your right hand and like the apex of where you would kind of like hit your basically as your the left side of your body is moving up you then let go and the left side of your body keeps going which means your left hand will then grab a higher point and you're basically like springing yourself up essentially so you basically are creating your own momentum to climb up these stages and to get further and further Uh, and i think the thing that's cool about it is that it doesn't just stick with this single concept and say okay we're just going to make it harder and harder they start introducing some fun elements so there are levels like at the end where you get into a barrel blaster and you are going upwards and you're using left and right to kind of maintain where you are and and, uh, kind of go up to the top they introduce um rocks so these rocks look like the handholds but they are in fact things that you can grab so you keep spinning on one you grab a rock in the other hand and then you let go of the rock and the rock then becomes a projectile that you use to throw at oh enemies this so you... so much more mechanically deep than i thought it was at the yeah time, for sure yeah totally it's, it's so cool because i didn't expect it to have quote-unquote combat in that way but like mm. it is still a puzzle game in a sense where you have to figure out what the layout is and what enemies you have to go up against but um having that a little bit more engagement having that ability to like grab objects or you know hang on to things like there's puzzles where 
you will be going across this level and you have to grab onto this lever and the lever will pull down and that will open a door and then you have to go back somewhere else like there there are the bonus barrels as well so you find these bonus barrels that will take you to areas where you can go and collect a bunch of bananas just like a lot of the Donkey Kong Country games right you find those bonus areas to give you loads of stuff um which is nice that they have that in here as well and uh and yeah i, I will say that it, at the end it does get like very difficult uh, to a point where i was like i'm just safe stating like i was safe stating while i'm holding on to it basically i'd hold on to a handheld and then pause the game save state it then keep holding the shoulder buttons unpause because if you unpause and you're not holding the shoulder buttons you'll just fall right oh so my God. so it's a lot it was a lot of like uh just and there's making... no like checkpoints it's just literally no. three levels per world you uh-huh. said yep and exactly. the only checkpoint is well it's not a checkpoint i no. guess but a, a point at which you could make a safe state i should call it between the levels i guess yeah yeah so there's there's a because at the end of the game you are just in the air constantly and you are just you're basically constantly holding a handheld of some kind uh i keep by the way i keep saying handheld handhold and i can't decide which one i want to say and i think i've said either one like 17 times uh while talking about this game i think when you're safe stating and you're talking about playing a game on a steam mm-hmm. deck and it's a handheld right. but you're uh-huh. talking about the handhold that you have to right. hold in order yeah. to do the safe state on the handheld that's where my <laughs> brain has gone bananas I was, yeah, excuse the pun yeah. bananas yeah. but yeah, yeah it's it's like I'm a bit confused, but I see what you're saying. Yes. I see what you're trying to say, I yes. think. Yes, yes. The, the thing that I grab onto, right? Yeah. All these little pins, these little fucking, these dots in the sky, these dots that I'm holding onto, right? By the end of the game, you are constantly, there's no land for you to sit on. You are constantly holding one of the shoulder buttons in order to do that. And I can imagine people back in the day got some real cramp in their hands from <laughs> playing this game, on, on the <laughs> especially the original GBA. Um but uh but yeah i I think it it does have a lot of personality and it does have lots of distinct ideas and it and it feels fresh i mean some of the ideas are bad ideas like there's an ice world because of course there is and the ice handhelds are a fucking nightmare holy shit you talk about ice physics on stuff when you talk about ice physics on like you're trying to grab a thing but you just keep sliding and it's like this this was just a bad decision. I totally get what the design I'm is. I'm so glad you saw never had like ice mechanics. It's oh like I'm God. sliding on the ice and hold yeah. and held. But this yeah. is just a, a nightmare. And um and like I that was the point where I was like, okay, this is just bullshit. I'm gonna just save state every second uh, you know, handhold that I have just so I can get to a reasonable place with this and there's definitely some where it's like this is i had to try this seven or eight times in a row and reload save states because it was just really difficult to nail the timing and all that sort of stuff and yeah i I honestly i would have given up on this game if i hadn't had that uh ability but you know that's the nice thing about going back to gba games or nes games or super nintendo games in this day and age is we can enjoy the feeling of those games and not have to worry about the bullshit uh kind of things because Mm. quality of life didn't exist back then guarantee if you made one of these games today they would give you checkpoints it would be easier they'd have difficulty modes they'd have all the accessibility options that you would want i think companies are also less scared to make shorter games um, yeah because obviously this shortens the game quite a lot like how long does it take you to be with the save states yeah probably like one week of playing it half an hour a night so i would say maybe four hours maximum half Um, hour is like your your bedtime slot yeah pretty much it's never less it's never more it's just half an hour every generally yeah because i try and go to bed a little like if i can do i try and make it an hour um but uh but yeah it's uh it varies it depends um how i'm feeling but um but it's yeah it's, it's a really cool little piece of nintendo history that i've always Mm. just been curious about um and uh yeah the the bosses uh, you you kind of asked about them but the bosses are very very much like okay here's just a giant board that you can use so you have like pegs everywhere to hold on to um and it's gonna be uh like a thing that is on it that's chasing you around it or it's a guy that's moving about it and you're gonna have to basically it's like a question of how do you get in position to hold on with your arms to build that tension to then knock yourself yourself into them ping yourself at them um and it gets it gets tricky uh with some of those but they always are slightly different from each other and they get uh, quite creative um and yeah the final one of the final challenges is really difficult you're basically racing king k rule up the top of a thing it's a it's essentially a race as a boss battle and i swear to god i had to do that thing like 
40 times like oh it was God. it was so difficult like you basically have to perfectly do your momentum to get your movement fast enough to beat him to the top it is so difficult and the time okay. that i did do it was within like a fucking hair's inch like just like the 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 very bare slight pixel i managed to eke out and beat him um so uh yeah that stuff is definitely over tuned i would say and like probably wasn't well thought through like how difficult that ended up being um but yeah i did i did manage to finish it in the end and yeah i think there's there's some just really cool ideas in there um and uh again i so the one thing that i realized after i played this uh, and from the show matt lorigan mentioned on twitter uh, there was a sequel to this game which i didn't know existed there is a ds follow-up DK gets all the weird games yeah there was a ds follow-up to this i can't remember oh, the yeah, name i think course. it's yeah. called jungle climber i believe is it um and with the ds obviously it uses the two screens and apparently it's a much better version of the idea that king of swing had uh, mm, and implements it uh, a little bit better so uh, i have been very curious uh, to check that out also i think it's more difficult to play that because steam deck with ds games is not quite as good uh, because the way the screen is set up so it doesn't doesn't work as smoothly especially with a game like this where the two screens together are so crucial to it um so i might have to find another way to to play that at some point but i would love to check that out um seems like a really really cool uh kind of follow up to this and uh yeah but i'm glad i played this one because this is the one that i knew from childhood that i was always curious about so i was like had donkey kong king of swing it's actually i think i believe it's actually just called dk king of swing if right, you go on right. to wikipedia it, there's no donkey kong in the name it's just called dk king of swing i think um, what, what is so weird about dk is they do go for the really unusual games with him quite a lot so you've got like king of swing donkey konga uh jungle beat uh what's the one where with the racing on the yeah the, bongos? the bongo blast or something bongo the blast, jet the jet right. race one um which i also have tried on my steam deck and mapping that control wise with the wii controls is a goddamn nightmare oh, but God. um i have tried to play that uh, that was and, uh, wiimote and nunchuck kind of yes. know, drumming as it were just to excel go forward a bit like Pod precisely racing, yeah 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 exactly it's super weird um but yeah you're right they there was a period of time where donkey kong was nintendo's kirby where he was just thrown yeah. at ideas and hey sometimes they were super weird like king swing and uh yeah yeah but then uh, they made returns and tropical freeze and things were great and then he vanished again <laughs> yeah disappeared disappeared, disappeared. From the, face of the earth um so okay he reappeared in mario versus donkey kong remake right yes um, yeah which is getting i would argue fairly middling reviews i would um, argue uh appropriate reviews <laughs> appropriate um, reviews um i think the original got slightly better reviews but not massively mm-hmm. better but yeah yeah um so yeah donkey kong king of swing um dk king of swing DK. it's a it's a cool uh nintendo curiosity and i hope to get to more of these as the year goes on um uh yeah I, I just need to figure out what my next um before bed game is bally so if anyone has any suggestions out there let me know um and uh yeah i'll see what i can do are you um, going to be able to i guess you won't be able to but like steam deck rebirth uh no because it's playstation yeah. only so i guess you need so, a playstation portal to, <laughs> to right i think there is a um there's a streaming app that exists that allows you to stream from PlayStation to Steam Deck. I can't remember what it's called, but I saw okay. people talking about it. But I just do not like streaming stuff. I just it yeah. never has worked for me. It's never yeah. been good. Um, never a great experience. So, yeah, that would be ideal, but uh, unfortunately, not able to do that. So, alas. Um, but Bally, uh, you were able to finish uh, another, another game. Another like Yeah uh yeah finished up cult of the lamb um just like i was describing before where i said i like a a roguelike that has you know a clear beginning middle and end and some credits uh, like hades cult of the lamb is just like that like it's got a final boss you defeat the final boss you get some credits my satisfaction is fulfilled i can tick the box and i feel good um so yeah i i think that the one frustration with the ending of Cult of the Lamb is you have to have 20 cult uh, members just to face the final boss. And if one of them dies and you go down to 19, you need to get another one just to face the boss again. Like you have to always have 20 alive. Mm. 
and you know, like how, i said how do they how do you get them do they just like arrive randomly or is there a way of like you getting get them, them in dungeons oh, but you I can see. also sometimes they do arrive randomly uh and there's also one that respawns as it were every day uh that you can buy so if you've broken the system the money systems which you probably should have by this point and i had loads of money uh I could just buy the daily one. But occasionally I'd have one day where two of my cult members died. I'd go and buy the daily one and I'd go from 20 to 18 back up to 19, try and face the final boss and be like, nope, you need 20. And then I'd just do a quick half dungeon run, get another one. And it's just a bit like, I would have liked if they could, you could just reach the 20 cult member threshold and then you can just take on the boss as many times as you want without having yeah. to worry about it. But um, other than that, very minor gripe i think the final boss was very fun to face i think you it is quite a challenging boss fight and you definitely need as much assistance as you can get from your cult and what i mean by that is you you get like a demonic ring circle or whatever it's called and you can turn your cult members into demons and the demons come with you into the boss fight now these demons will maybe attack the boss or they'll drop random health pickups or they'll stand back and just shoot shots at the boss like in a very turtley manner like i always love uh and so i definitely had to have three demons with me for these runs at the final boss and boosted my health a bit with some other thing and it did take me a good few times i want to say but i think it was a really good challenge um i do think the the combat is not the strongest part of the game and if you're coming from a game like hades where the combat just feels smooth as butter i think there will be some people particularly very sensitive people maybe like mbz mm. um who might find the combat a little bit rudimentary a little bit finicky but um yeah. i think it holds up for what the game is going for and i don't think the final boss is difficult to the point of oh i wish the controls were better this for this game it was just it was just quite a tough fight um and there's a there's a few stages to it but i i think it was a really nice ending to the game and you know i think overall it's a very strange dark game i do think the the cult management is more fun and interesting than the the dungeon run element i think the game is also maybe just a little bit on the long side i think it took me maybe 17 and a half 18 hours to play the whole game and definitely from hours kind of 12 to 16 where i felt like i'd pretty much done everything in my cult i was getting to the end of the game it did feel a little bit more all the systems felt a lot less fresh and a lot less exciting as th than say the first eight hours of the game where i think the game really shines and you're unlocking new stuff in your cult and then you, there's really quirky things that you're unlocking with all of the um the sermons and the rituals and different things you can do and by the end of the game you've kind of picked your favorite ones you know how the machine works and you're just trying to push that machine out as much as possible to boost your cult and then take on the final game bosses and as it were so like i think that it's it's strongest on the build uh but then when you're kind of in it and doing the dungeon runs it's maybe can get a little bit not monotonous but it, it doesn't feel quite as fresh uh but the final boss was very satisfying and i still think cult of the lamb is a fantastic game that everyone everyone should play even if you think the art style and themings are a little bit odd like i did initially i think i think that they really explain why that art style and that theming works so well lovely uh, well that's good yeah i definitely again uh it's on the never-ending list of good indies that i need to play alongside chicory alongside yeah fucking every boomerang x and neon oh, white one, yeah. and there's so many there's so many uh, and i would like to i would like it's to play a real it, so. large quantity especially the last four or five years where it's like damn it's so you it's so hard to keep up with some of these good indies like yeah. there's just so many it's great it means you don't run out uh, at least and there's always something to look forward to so um yeah uh yeah good stuff uh speaking of uh i finally got around to uh, a game that a lot of people were talking about uh, quite a bit uh, i think it did it come out last year or maybe it was the year before um a little to the left uh, which is a game that got a lot of nintendo uh coverage uh from lots of indies and stuff like that and it is essentially i would say a cousin to unpacking but I would say very different as a game. Um, so I think the thing I really liked about Unpacking was that it was able to take these mechanics but use them to leverage an interesting story um, and use that to kind of talk about, like, 
it went beyond what you usually would get from an experience like that where it's like normally it'd just be like okay you're just gonna do these puzzles put these things in places and that's the game right and there's no other added context i would say a little to the left is like what if unpacking didn't have the added context essentially so it is a lot more level based and it is a it is an arrangement game i guess i would call it um where so for example uh you will be shown um, a bunch of pieces of paper and they're all varying different sizes and the game doesn't tell you what to do but you can basically move these pieces of paper around on the screen and drop them different places um and eventually you realize oh this piece of paper can stack on top of this other one and uh they basically kind of start forming a pile and so this stack essentially happens and you basically finish the stage by stacking the pieces of paper in order of size from biggest to largest on top of one another so it's it's essentially like it's basically like Marie Kondo the game where you're just like you are I guess she, she's more about getting rid of stuff right as opposed to tidying stuff up but eh, I guess there's both, a little bit yeah a little bit of both um but yeah the idea is that you are just given these scenes these tableaus these kind of flat uh kind of images with kind of interactivity to them and you're you're given no explanation it's just like just figure it out you know so like here is three flower pots and you're like okay i can move the flower pots what is that and then you realize oh the leaves from the flower pot here match up with the leaves from this flower pot and so this one needs to go in the middle this one needs to go on the left and this one needs to go on the right and then oh look you can see the pattern it's all done together is it, uh, is it symmetrical or is it just... they they fit into each other so right. like you know if something has like a concave divot and something else has a convex oh, thing pushing okay. out you see how they basically fit together essentially in um, and this is in the room it's not in a room no it's usually just like on a it's basically like imagine um a piece of paper like a kind of textured background let's say like a mm -hmm. pink textured background and then these objects are just on top of it and um sometimes there's no context to it at all sometimes it's like here's someone's open drawer and you're looking at the drawer from right. top down perspective and there's a bunch of just stuff just stuffed in there unorganized and all over the place and you basically then have to take everything out to the side organize it and then reorganize it perfectly ah, inside okay, right, the drawer right. that that's that kind of and every level is slightly different sometimes it's like here's just a giant plant and you're expected to figure out oh in order to make it symmetrical i have to pluck these leaves from these specific branches in order to do it is that, that sort fun of stuff. it so i think at the beginning i was enjoying it because it's quite simple it's quite obvious what you have to do and it's it's very tangible it has a satisfaction to grabbing things and putting things down and moving mm. things about like it's a it's super polished has great sound design you know like when you pick up a uh, pencil nice. and you put down the pencil because i saw it was like three and a half hours and i thought mm. that seems like a really long time for this concept yes um and i think it could be i think i have more problems with it not to do with length um for me so i really enjoyed the start of this game i think that it, it has a lot of kind of fun kind of just like i said moving things around feel satisfying and good there's an early level that took me a little while to do because it's basically okay here's just here's um essentially a bookshelf but here's just like 12 books in a row and you look at the spines and you can see that there's a pattern at the bottom of each spine and you you look at it and you're like oh, these have to match up somehow and so i spent a long time just like moving these books around trying to get the exact right pattern that would mean so that when you it's like when you put it on a bookshelf right and there are those you know for the wheel of time for example you buy a special edition of the wheel of time and you put it on your bookshelf and like the the spine spells out the wheel of time or right. whatever right when you put it all back to back it's kind of that thing we're we... using a mouse for this game on your yes. pc are you yes. okay that i might have made it a lot easier than a uh, gamepad that, that's what i was going to say is like so this game is on switch as well which i would recommend playing it there because of touchscreen support i think that makes a lot of sense like this is the type of game where frankly if you're playing it with a controller i think you might be better off not playing it at all maybe harsh to say that but it feels it's so built i did play unpacking with a controller that's true um and maybe it does work okay but it feels so custom built for either a mouse or a touch screen and so if you 
play it on Switch, that would be ideal, or even on Steam Deck, that would be ideal. Uh, but yeah, using a mouse is much easier because you can just quickly grab and drag things, especially for organization when the levels get more complicated and you have lots of elements to work with. I, like, I feel like a controller probably has to use like a virtual mouse essentially um, in order to make it work. So, um, so I, I enjoyed that. But then, so that was my first play session with it, which was like an hour. And then I came back today, this morning, to play it. And I played another hour. And this hour was much worse than my first. And, and I think partially it's because there's a ramp up in density and complexity. But also the game just struggles, I think, to communicate what it actually wants you to do. Because it just mm. hands you a thing and it's like, figure it the fuck out, mate. Like, they just they don't give you any indication of what they're looking for or what they want. And so you have to notice something um, and there were some levels where it, it has a it has a hint system, which is cool, where you basically go to the menu and you take this eraser and you can start erasing away at an image that basically will reveal what the solution is. So the solution will be in full, but you can just start slowly erasing at it and be like, I only want to reveal a little bit of this image to give me a sense of how to go with this thing. There were about four or five levels this morning where I erased the entire thing. I looked at the solution. I looked back at the puzzle and I was like, I still don't understand what you want me to do. I know, <laughs> I know that this is the answer. I have no idea why it's the answer. I don't know what what you were trying to tell me to do. Like I, I, I had no clue. Um, and I think that definitely, because they try to ramp up the challenge in the back half, it it makes it so that you almost lose the plot. Because I think the reason why this game can work is because it's a relaxing thing that is nice to tool around with and doesn't make you think too hard the moment it starts to make you think a bit too hard i think that's where it started to lose me because it got to that puzzle frustration point that we often talk about where i was like i don't really know what i'm supposed to be doing here and so i'm just moving things about randomly haphazardly hoping something will work without not really knowing what i'm doing and yeah it uh, at least it has this uh option which is it, basically in the menu it says let it be which is basically you can just skip the puzzle and it will count it as done basically for your run so at the end when you look at the thing and it's all like filled in everything will be filled in so you don't have that sense of like oh i had to skip it and so it's empty because i couldn't figure it out like the game is nice enough to do that um but yeah i i i was skipping quite frequently towards the end of the game i've not finished it yet i still have like maybe 10 or so puzzles to go mm. um i'll probably just go and finish those off but i i just i think that there, there could have been so much more with this i think part of the other frustration i have is so for example today i was doing one where you have to put cutlery and kitchen stuff into a drawer and i did that too i unloaded the dishwasher uh -huh, yeah exactly it's actually one of my favorite things to do uh, house chore wise i just like the, with a podcast of exactly course. exactly yes. i just like the the kind of like um not the monotony of it but just like i always say to caroline before i do any house chore and she's in the room i was like do you want me to talk to you while I do this chore or can I put in the uh -huh. podcast? It's yeah, like yeah. just like a check-in. Right, and yeah. Like, totally. oh, we'll chat and then, yeah. But yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, so I had to fill this drawer with stuff and I did. And I was like, everything fits perfectly here. What's what's wrong? What is the thing that's wrong? The thing that's wrong is that I had the spoons and the forks in the wrong spot. But oh, the, the, the spot to put the spoons in the fork are the exact same size. They're right next to each other. <sighs> And there's no indication of which one should be in the left and which one should be in the right. So it was a case of like, it looks like it's fine, but like the indicator was that the forks were kind of, when, when they're pushed in, they're kind of shown as next to each other as opposed to right on top of each other. And I, it just wasn't clear that that's what the game wanted as a solution because th there's, there's sometimes where things magnetize into a spot and you're like, oh, that must mean it's right. But, but sometimes it doesn't. And the way the sound design works and the way that you place something, sometimes it's not obvious that it's snapped or magnetically snapped into a spot. Mm. And sometimes you have a level where you're moving like the papers I talked about. The way to start that is you have to clear everything out of the way and put the biggest paper right in the middle and then it will magnetically snap there. But if there are other papers covering that middle section, it won't because it's being covered by other stuff. So it won't automatically magnetic. So like because everything is invisible and this magnetic snapping is invisible you often get to these points where you're like i don't know where i should like sometimes it wants you to order things by size 
and I'm like, okay, I want to put this in a place to start ordering them, but I don't know where on the screen it wants me to put it to start ordering, if you know what I mean, right? There's no, there's no like, dotted line to say, this is the starting point. Like, I think that would be an easy solution to this, or at least resolution to some of these puzzles. Like, every, you just need a starting point. And if you give somebody that, then they can start working on it from there. But I think the lack of starting point, the lack of direction, means that I often got frustrated and you know eventually got to a point where even after looking at the solution directly i just still had no fucking idea what it asked what it wanted from me um so yeah a little disappointing unfortunately because i think i heard a lot of good things about a little to the left and I, I still think it has a really great style i think visually super nice looking um charming music just a very chill vibe and great like polish to it like it really feels like a super polished game but I think from a game design perspective, I think it lacks a lot of fundamentals in terms of getting a player to understand what the game wants from it. Um, so, yeah, I definitely mm. uh, think it's worth checking out. Um, and it is on Game Pass now, so that's the reason that I, I finally got around to it. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I played it through that and didn't buy it outright because I think I would have been a little disappointed had that been the case. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a great uh, kind of great little thing to mess around with especially the beginning um i'd almost recommend just playing half of it and just abandoning it if i'm honest because that's yeah, what i'm tempted to do yeah it yeah. does sound a little frustrating yeah um so yeah I'll, I'll probably wrap it up but um yeah left me a little disappointed um but uh, a little to the left disappointed. a little to the left of uh 90 on metacritic yes yeah exactly a <laughs> little little bit lower down uh the bar but um yeah uh cool that i was able to check it out at least and uh yeah it's another one kind of uh ticked off the list that uh can then try and uh move on to some other things that are back on my backlog so there you go um lovely well that is going to do us for the first part of the show don't go anywhere though because we'll be back right after this break to talk about that nintendo partner showcase see you in a bit Alright everybody, welcome back to the second part of today's show. It's finally happened, Bally and Nintendo listened to us. Well, actually they listened to Phil Spencer, uh, is what really happened, because had all this Xbox kerfuffle not happened, we would have been delayed on responding to the Nintendo Partner Showcase, but uh, hey, the timing worked out a little better for Thank us this time. Thank you, Phil time. Spencer. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Appreciate it. Shout show. out to you and all your friends. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a weird... Um, it's a weird context, I guess, for this stuff, right? Because if you're listening to this in the year 2035 and you're like, what is the deal with this partner showcase? Um, I think it's important to give context to what's happened where Microsoft have had leaks surrounding their games coming to other platforms. And so they put out a podcast where they were like, it's fine, it's only four games and we're not going to tell you what they are. Um, and the reason for that is because a couple of them got announced in this Nintendo Partner Showcase, so clearly they had a deal with Nintendo to reveal them uh, in this specific thing to say, hey, they're coming to your platform. Um, but uh, but also, uh, there's another point I was going to make surrounding the context for this, and now I've completely forgotten. Uh, oh, it's the Switch 2, of course, the Switch 2. Mm. So the other part of this context is everyone had a rumour of, okay, they're going to do a Partner Showcase in February, but 
that's because they're lining up a switch 2 reveal in march and that was the thing of like it's not going to be the traditional nintendo direct in february it's going to be a little bit of a low-key one but they're gearing up for a march reveal of the switch 2 and then like two weeks later everyone was like actually nintendo delayed the switch 2 and so it's probably and now not. here is a ton of games coming in 2024 mm -hmm. and very much fills out the year and very much confirms in my mind switch to is start of 2025 which is i mean in some ways it is disappointing right because i think all of us in the nintendo community are probably are like fired up of like it's gonna happen so soon yeah. we're gonna find out so soon i feel like we didn't um, start the fire the journalists did they and did, that's why yeah. it feels a little bit um betrayal's wrong word yeah it just feels yeah. a bit like Okay, I was prepared to get hyped when the hype train was ready to start, and uh -huh. the, the journalists set off the hype, tri hi hype train, and then Nintendo said, hold, hold your horses, it's, we're actually 2025, and the journalists reported on that, and now it feels a bit like a bit of a damp squib. It feels like, okay, we're going to get a partner showcase, but that's because they're going to go big in March, and now <laughs> it's like, you get a partner showcase... And that's it. And and now we and now we have to wait even longer to see what what else Nintendo have for us. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think uh, overall, uh, let's talk about our, our thoughts on this this showcase generally. Bali, how did you feel uh, about this uh, this shotgun blast of video games? Yeah, for a partner showcase, it does a lot of the right things that these other partner showcases have normally done, where. There's a spattering of new releases that we've not heard about that are really cool. There's a spattering of shadow drops. There's some cool demos. There's some really interesting remakes. There's some series that have new games that haven't had a series in what feels like 14 years. Uh huh. Um, I'm looking at you, World of Goo, as well as Endless Ocean. Right. Um, and then there's also just really other random ports. And when you put it all together it's like hey if you want to play switch in the year 2024 there's going to be a lot of great stuff on there that isn't just nintendo first party and that's really cool and i think it takes all those boxes and i'm pretty excited to try out some of these games yeah um i think my reaction as i mentioned before to this direct was weird because i was in a weird dopamine filled brain state so i watched it and i was like that was great what a fun time and then i immediately forgot everything that happened um and then i came back to it and i was like yeah i still actually really liked it um and um i think i tweeted this because uh, i didn't get to watch it at the time i watched it delayed and then i live tweeted my delayed reaction <laughs> to the nintendo direct <laughs> but um i tweeted after it finished that this is basic this direct was made for those sickos who go to kex on a thursday afternoon to try to find <laughs> a three pound coffee copy of fossil fighters for nintendo 3ds right like it's so many of the games here are like endless like endless ocean is a game i go to kex to find right like yes. that is that is the kind of tier that we're talking you never about played it, did you no but i own it <laughs> i oh, did but i did i bought it from a cex like and three there were two years ago weren't there actually there, there were, were two, two yeah so yeah. i think i bought endless ocean one so i okay. have the wii version of endless ocean um it so got i will decent reviews at the time nothing stellar right no was, no it did, did fine yeah so um so yeah that's something i'm super interested like I, I think there's there's just a lot of things here that are just for people like me who like want to go and play the unsung heroes of nintendo's past lineups right um i think yeah we can get into it but lots of games with that energy right like a real this is the last year of the switch energy yeah, uh, if i'm gonna yeah. be honest um even more so than previous partner showcases or directs that we've had this is really like hey what if we took monster hunter stories one from 3ds how about that you know like um yeah definitely uh a lot of that going on but um yeah maybe let's uh get into some of the actual announcements here bally so uh we'll do what we usually do where we probably won't cover everything but we'll just pick out things that spoke to us and we can uh break them down as, as we go so what do you want to go to first uh it's cool that we're getting another new monkey ball game yeah let's fucking go man i didn't play the last new one or was that a remake i'm getting the, so the last now. one was a remake of one and two which i did play and right. i did buy on switch and was great like it was uh it was a really good um kind of vindication for my childhood self who never managed to finish monkey ball 2 um uh so i was able to finish every single level uh every single that thing from back in the day they were very hard games they were yeah but I, I think like they did such a good job of remaking those games and 
here's the thing even in my brain adult dopamine destroyed state i looked at that trailer and i instantly recognized like design tendencies and elements and physics from the remake of monkey ball one and two and i think one of the problems that happened with monkey ball is it eventually got to this spot after the first two games where games were coming out but they none of them had the design sensibility or the challenge or the the kind of creativity um and just there's a certain feel of monkey ball one and two and none of the subsequent sequels got close to that i felt um you know the one we played on wii was fine enough but it was wasn't the same right it just was it didn't have the same yeah. level of quality to it and from the small snippets of gameplay that we've seen from banana rumble which is the new one it feels like it might be it might be a good You're follow-up an actual i'm not confident no but like it, from what little we've seen so far it feels like it could be in that range and if it is if the reviews are good i'm 100 percent on board for this like monkey ball is one of those series that i think has been dormant for so long and is finally coming back into the limelight and if it's a good one of those i will be delighted to play another monkey ball because i just i really like the series one of my favorite series and i think it's just an underrated style of game like we just don't get anything like it anymore yeah that's very true it's really cool i i've i've not jumped back into monkey ball since <laughs> Was it the Wii? I think it was. It must have been the Wii. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was a gap where they didn't really put out any. I think that no. Switch is the first time they've done that. But there were a handful of years where we played the DS game and the Wii game. I played and the GBA game, the, the GBA DS game. game. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, they were great. I really enjoyed them. And I famously put my Wiimote into your window. At your <laughs> yes. Playing that was a Monkey Ball mini game. Exactly. Um, yeah. Damn you, Wii strap that broke. Uh -huh. That's what I blame it on. And my sweaty hand. But. Um, uh -huh yeah i i think it's a, it's always been a cool game in terms of strong single player but also actually some pretty solid party modes mini games that kind of thing as well so yeah it's a nice combo seems like they're adding some of that stuff to this yeah. as well so that's good um would like to play if i have time this year but there are some very yeah. big long games coming out that i want to try to get to so so yeah both this and endless ocean i saw were cheaper priced as well so they're like 40 pounds but you can get them for 35 on places like shop 2 and stuff like that um mm. which is cool um yeah i guess endless ocean is the uh the other one that we kind of referred to previously but i think it's called ocean luminous or something like that um and yeah i i've never played this series before really but i do own what's the what's the loop what's the yeah do you just swim and explore and then you're basically ticking off species that you see and i think they, I... they mentioned um that like there's some mythological species right. in this one which sounds yeah. interesting and it's it's weird because when it came out back in i don't know 2008 2009 whenever mm -hmm. it felt like the selling point is that it's on wii and that it'll have an interesting control scheme and that ultimately it's just kind of like a a kind of cheaper but nice chill exploration game um and they, they fell of, into the kind of casual market approach of brain training and stuff right very much so you can basically put this in the same brackets like animal crossing nintendo dogs but uh -huh. on wii it's a touch um, generations title but the wii version totally of that. but it's kind of like now that we're in 2024 and it's coming out on switch it's kind of the gate sort of game that you'd be like this is a really cool concept, but wouldn't I want to do this on a higher resolution, higher frame rate mm, kind of sure, platform? Yeah. If, the, if it's all about the visuals, the atmosphere, the different species, maybe we're at the point where trying to do something like that on Switch will fall flat. I don't know. It might be great. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hoping it will be great. And if it gets some decent reviews, I'd be keen to give it a whirl. But um, it just seems like a very strange concept of game for 2024 yeah i i don't know what the gameplay loop was of the original games whether it was just a collection game essentially it might be photography or something in it It like. might be yeah it's almost like a glorified you better i don't boot know it up and find out i guess so yeah i do have it so i should i should give it a go and uh, see what the deal is with the original one and i definitely if i play this i would like to play that first one first just to get a sense of it so i can speak to like what is different what has changed um turns out it's a port <laughs> uh-huh yeah it turns out it's, it's basically what they do, did with star fox zero and all the star fox games they just remake 64 again and again endlessly um 
but yeah yeah i i am just i'm very my curiosity is very much peaked because like who in a million years would think nintendo are going to return to endless ocean like it's it, it, it again it speaks to the end of lifeness of this presentation where they're just clutching for straws and they're like okay like here's a dartboard of like 17 franchises that have been dead for a decade throw a dart which one does it hit and like last time it was um it was fucking another code and okay. the time before that it was famicom detective club right and like we're, we're slowly just like chipping away at these forgotten <laughs> nintendo franchises i mean that's gonna be some niche endless ocean fans who are like you have got to be kidding me that we yes. are getting an endless ocean game in 2024 this yeah. is insane i i need to go and find the nintendo direct reactions from those people in particular yes I, I i always love that i always love seeing those people react um so yeah very curious about it uh seems like a cool thing um yeah i want to want to see some more um bali next up for you uh I'll just tick off a couple. We already knew about these games, but it's nice to see them. And I think we've got release date. I think Pepper Grinder is like now March, but Pepper Grinder, mm-hmm. Tales of Kinzara Zao. Good to see both of those coming to Switch. I think we already knew that, but both of those look really good. Um, yeah, I will say Tales of Kinzara looks really rough on Switch. And it I think does, that it, actually? also yeah. speaks to how poorly it ran when I tried the demo on Steam Deck. Like, it fe- especially coming off prince of persia one of the best switch ports of all time like a remarkable feat how smooth how good that game looks and this is going to be directly compared to it in a lot of instances yeah. and that switch port i think is going to be very rough unfortunately it just does not look good at all this is the case with a few games in this presentation there was the should kingdom come deliverance at the end which i have no interest in and we won't talk about aside from the fact that when i saw it i was like this looks like fucking trash. Like, it just, it looks so bad. We are um, very ready for a Switch 2. So ready. And unfortunately, it's not going to come anytime soon. But yeah, some of these games are just really struggling. And people are just trying to get them on these the system as the last kind of gasp. But mm. a lot of them are just like, ah, oh, it doesn't quite well, work. Well, we can maybe um, jump straight into like the X- two Xbox games. Because yeah, I guess so. There were I mean, huge yeah. rumors, obviously, of Hi-Fi Rush coming to Switch. And it sounds like it's not coming to Switch. It's coming no. to Switch 2 because... Well, here's the... We- yeah, that's the weird thing, right? Because the leak also had a t-shirt that suggested Nintendo. Um, so we know that it's going to come to a Nintendo system. But does that mean because Hi-Fi Rush Rush is a kind of visually spectacular game and definitely you want to play it at a higher frame rate and resolution, maybe it is being saved for that because I think it's eventually going to come. It's just... I think it would be short change going on to just Switch, right? Yeah, and it, is it weird, the idea of Hi-Fi Rush coming to Switch 2 in 2025? Is that going to... I don't think so. No, I think it's a good... It's probably a good baseline to look at and say, hey, here's how powerful the Switch 2 is because you can see what it looks compared to other versions and it might be a good uh, comparison point. Not that Nintendo is worried about that mm. i think microsoft might be more interested in yeah having a good experience with that game which is weird especially because they again one of these games is grounded which oh boy they opened with that and i was like man this does not again does not it's look good opener, it looks yeah. very very rough um visually i think is is the case which ground is a great game i had i've had a great time playing that game uh, me and you playing grounded uh, was a lot of fun and um, yeah yeah i i'd love to return to it at some point but i don't think i'd ever play that game on switch i think it just doesn't doesn't work very well no, a lot of online no. stuff going on with it but also it's just it it looks so grubby um unfortunately yeah so. hopefully pentiment would run fine on switch right pentiment is a perfect game for switch um, right because it's a 2d game the art style is very rudimentary you, you um, said it got done dirty by being stuck in that reel <laughs> uh, frankly the disrespect <laughs> for pentiment i can't abide by it pentiment is like I think it's the best game Xbox have published in the last decade, maybe. Like, I, I think it's fucking remarkable. Like, some of the best writing character work. Do they not publish Ori? Does that, that's different. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's internal. Pentiment's owned by Microsoft, yes. so um, I guess that would, would be the caveat there. But um, 
yeah, I cannot recommend Pentiment more highly. If you've heard anything about it and it seems anywhere close to something you'd be interested in, definitely pick it up on Switch because it feels like a great handheld game as well. There's a there's a storybook quality to it. It is almost a visual novel, uh, really. So I think it fits the console perfectly, and I think there's you can find a great audience for it there. So yeah, strongly recommend if you've if you've not played Pentiment. If you look at it and you're like, it's a bit of a weird art style. It might not be for me. And I kind of thought that when I first saw it, just please look past that because it is just mm. it's some of the best writing in it, games l- l- uh, in like we said with hi-fi rush it does feel like graphical power is maybe the reason that's going to come to switch to obviously yeah um the other one that was obviously rumored loads was um sea of thieves right and that's a game that's got a lot of nintendo energy obviously made by rare yeah and clearly they would have loved to have had that on switch but i've made the call you know what I'm not sure the C is going to look particularly nice uh-huh, <laughs> on, yeah. on Switch 1. Maybe that's another one that comes to Switch 2. So I guess Pentiment and Grounded became, even though I'd argue Hi-Fi Rush and Sea of Thieves maybe have more Nintendo energy, yeah. Pentiment and Grounded end up being the two that come to Switch 1 because they're the two it can manage. Yeah, Arguably Grounded yeah. It's not managing it very well, but it can still put something out, right? Right. I, yeah, I, I to me, I'm kind of surprised that Sea of Thieves... Because, I mean, to me, Ground and Sea of Thieves are very similar. Like, they're both kind of life service But that, that, that sea in Sea of Thieves looks really nice. I guess I guess it's more the size of the world, right? Because yeah. Sea of Thieves does have a huge ocean. And Grounded, again, it's, it's a backyard, but it's, like, shrunk down. So there's probably a bit more of a... Um, it's a little more contained, I guess, than Sea of Thieves is, so it probably made it easier to, to get that to work. But yeah, I, I think eventually, you know, when we have another console, all these games will be on there and, you know, that mm. will make perfect sense. So, but yeah, again, the funny thing, a lot of people out there were like, man, I was really surprised they didn't have like Phil Spencer come here and say Xbox <laughs> stuff. And I'm like, it's not how Nintendo does anything. Like, Nintendo are <laughs> they, not going to give you special... Get, like nintendo executives to speak in these no. things it's just that, that the american voiceover right exactly like and it's also it's like nintendo this is they don't they don't give people reverence they treat everyone who is not them with equal measure which is to say microsoft is don't the same exist. as an indie yeah yeah exactly they're like they they they're just gonna they, they they're like here's another video game for you and here's another video game and they are all just treated pretty much the same which i think is respectful in some ways because it's like yeah the smaller guys get as much uh, kind of respect as the big ones do. So, yeah, a yeah. Nintendo partner is a Nintendo partner. Yes, cool exactly. We treat all our partners equally. These are all with... our partners. Yes, yes. Microsoft, um, their partner. They're just one studio, of our many partner. partners. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, cool. Uh, okay, I uh, I've been hearing some good stuff about Penny's Big Breakaway Valley. Um, mm. This game uh, from the team who made Sonic Mania. Uh, Sega decided. Yeah, let's not work with the team who made our best game in a decade. Let's just make our own one, which is far worse. Um, and uh, I guess really? it gave them the opportunity to uh, to go off and, and do their own thing. And what their own thing was is they wanted to make a 3D platformer. So this game has been in a bunch of Nintendo presentations before. Um, I think it had a lot of buzz because people from Nintendo audience perspective are always clamoring for the good old days of 3D platformers. Um and there just aren't that many out there there's not a lot of there's not a lot of them and also a lot of them are bad a lot of them are not good because nintendo sets such a high bar in terms of the quality of platforming they offer but i i do remember seeing this and thinking man this looks this looks quite good it looks like it, they mm. really have understood platforming well not many reviews yet and it's just been oh, okay. stealth released right yes because it was a shadow drop essentially shadow drop, uh, I should say. interestingly uh patrick klepik on remap was talking about how he got sent a code for it and his expectation was like oh this is like just a preview thing right so the people told him like oh don't play past this part and then he realized uh oh wait this is actually the full like he emailed them and and was like do i need anything else and they're like now nah, you've got the full game because they basically sent the full game to people uh just before they announced it which is interesting so hmm. yeah it's it's out there for everybody now to download and play and i know a lot of people have been checking it out but um it seemingly runs really well another example of if switch is your lead platform for your game you can make something look really good on switch right like prince of persia and now penny's big breakaway two games from third parties but they prioritize switch as their base version and lo and behold the switch version runs at 60 frames per second a 3d platformer right which only nintendo can pull off with super mario odyssey um 
but penny's big breakaway seems to be able to do it as well which is pretty shocking um but yeah i've i've definitely heard a good amount of buzz want to check this out at some point um but you know despite everyone thinking 2024 was gonna be a quiet year just games just keep falling out of the sky yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh yeah, I will get to it eventually, but um, it's it's on my list. I, I, think I want to it looks see really some cool. reviews, maybe, but I do want to get to it as well. I think yeah. it's got TNL written all over it for yeah. interview discussions, and we should probably give it a whirl soon. For sure. Um, Stuff. MEZ. Yeah. There's a game on this list where uh-huh. they combine anime with Metroidvania. Yes. Uh, and I believe you played the first one. Okay. Ender Lilies. I have not yet played... You have not played Ender Lilies. I've not so played it yet, no. They announced my the list. sequel, Ender Magnolia Bloom in the Mist. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, and I checked out, like, what was Ender Lilies? And, like, it was... They've got some good scores and stuff. It, so, like, I'm surprised you've not got to it yet. It sold extremely well. It sold over a million copies. Yeah. Um, How it's have one you not of those... played it yet? It, it came again, out 2021, I want to say. Yes. So, I feel like this is my year of catching back up on Metroidvanias, because I think there's just been a couple of years there where some have come out and not passed me by, but, like, I think because I, I'm i not as into the Soulsy type of Metroidvanias, right, personally. Mm. So, Blasphemous passed me by a little bit, and I think this, for a similar reason, passed me by. It's a game called Grime that also has vibes of that. Um and yeah, there's a few out there that basically go into kind of a Souls and Metroidvania blend. Um, and I tend to lean towards more pure Metroidvanias at the end of the day. So I haven't gone around to those, but I've, I've seen so much buzz around Ender Lilies and a lot of people say it's really good. I personally found the animation style a little off-putting generally. Like I like the character art. I think the character art is really nice, but there's this weird kind of puppety way the characters move and animate that i've never been a big fan of but um i think i can probably get over that and uh check it out so i i definitely want to play the first one but the second one looks interesting it feels like they're taking a totally different character different approach to it um and yeah i i want to see uh want to see what it turns out like um it's it's definitely a game that i should I'm trying to look at the the score of it how well the first one did because i feel like it's a game that probably did decently review wise but i couldn't remember if it if it was or if it was just my brain is overwritten that because i know the ski the steam review score is very i high. think ender um, lily's got 86 wow that's really impressive yeah. yeah 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 um so seems is it coming out some sometime this year isn't it they um, just said 2024 okay interesting well yeah i uh i definitely would like to so i'm, I'm currently playing through fist uh the uh rabbit metroidvania with the giant fist that guy um that one I started like a month ago and played two hours of and then other video games like Prince of Persia came out and I haven't got back to it yet but I started that and that seemed pretty cool so um yeah it's I think it it's a little bit of my Metroidvania catch-up year so I'd like to get Ender Lilies uh in there 85 not 86 but okay very good very good very good um lovely uh I uh I'd love to talk about uh an old game that is now new again uh and bali maybe for you something that you could be interested in uh have you any interest in epic mickey i am very interested in epic mickey it's kind of a f- infamous famous game where yeah. like it's got a lot of lore behind its making and... well you read jason fryer's book right where they talked right, about exactly. epic mickey. Um, yeah and was quite a big deal on we and kind of represents Disney and their history in video games is just very strange. Um, and I think Epic Mickey is definitely one of those strange games. And I'm not sure Epic Mickey reviewed the best. And I th- certainly think the sequel didn't do anything like as well as the first. But if this got, if this remaster or remake um, turns out to be pretty good, I'd like to give it a go. I, I, I don't yeah. know if it's just coming to Switch or it's coming like cross platform, but. Um, I'd be interested in where it runs best and what they do to it to make it uh, maybe a bit, a little more modern. Uh, mm. But I'm very, I'm a Disney fan. I want to see the characters in this world. And, you know, I, I've heard it's got some interesting story and platforming and I want to give it a go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of the story is like tied up with Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, I think. Uh, mm. I think plays a kind of pivotal role in in what this game is about another 3d platformer as well essentially yeah and it has just a cool mechanic right where you paint the world and you paint platforms into existence and just a really clever idea i think um and uh, just a cool cool game from a conceptual standpoint i know that people had their issues with it but 
I do remember the uh, the original game in any case getting some decent review scores and some people generally liking it. I think the second game was not as much uh, well thought of, but the first game certainly had its fan base and had had people who were behind it. So, and did you actually have a history in uh, Mickey two D platforming? What I was do. That game yes, you, we played. Was that on PlayStation Gosh. One? Yeah, PlayStation One. I think. Oh. Uh, mickey mania or something mickey mania, or mickey's yeah. mickey's adventure something along wonder, those lines did that get any decent reviews at the time i wonder oh god probably or were we just kids and liked any old crap i think it was brutally difficult I it, think was, it was, was i remember yeah. that bit yeah yeah Damn. um it was a cool game like it had some really interesting stuff with like you started off with steamboat willy and you went through mickey's history essentially mm. um through through 2d platforming um yeah, I'd, I cool. should probably, uh, again, pop that onto my Steam Deck and yeah. see how that is. But uh, yeah, Mickey uh, coming back with Epic, Mickey Rebrushed. Uh, sounds like a good time. Um, great. Bally, uh, any other ones you want to grab from here? Nothing that I'm particularly excited about. Um, like I said, it's weird that World of Goo is coming back after, yeah. what, 14 years or something? So yeah. I know you've had a torrid time with the first well, game yeah i mean i i tried world of goo and i just bounced off it like i immediately was not enjoying myself and didn't I think something about these like kind of bridge building games to me just doesn't tickle my brain in a way that i care about like i know a lot of people like that kind of architectural almost gameplay and mm. for me i think i just got frustrated being like well, how I have to build these foundations for so big to get across this gap that is so far and eventually it will be so heavy that it falls over and just topples into the abyss and I just can't make that gap because the just the architectural fundamentals didn't make any sense to me, you know? Like it I was like, how do I even make this work? Um and even yeah. on those like early levels or I got like maybe an hour or two into it okay. and it starts to get not difficult, but it, it puts challenges in front of you to where it's like yeah, you kind of need to have a bit more grounding or understanding of how this stuff works in order to get through and i just didn't and i just it, my brain doesn't work in that way and it just yeah just didn't work for me but you know I'm, a lot of people love it a lot of people love the the original game is always thought of as like one of those hidden gems of the wii and uh yeah i think it's uh it's cool it's coming back it's it's very weird that it is because this company has worked on a bunch of different games in the time yeah. since right they very much focused on programming really is like part of their identity the tomorrow corporation right like they had uh they had the uh fireplace game that i can't remember the name of now on wii u um that i did play and uh they've had a few other games as well a few on switch that haven't yeah made big waves that i remember um but totally. they'll share a similar art style i believe there yes very similar yeah. um, um so yeah uh well go too um yeah for me the other ones that stand out uh, there's a demo for Unicorn Overlord, which in any other normal week I probably would have played already and probably would have talked about on the show. Um, but I will download, I actually just downloaded it before we started recording. So uh, I'm going to check out Unicorn Overlord. Uh, feels like some good impressions coming out um, from previews from people. Um, I absolutely loved 13 Sentinels. So, you know, it's a follow up to that, not kind of like from a game perspective but it's the next game from vanillaware so interested because they have good narrative chops but also you're kind of combining it with a fire emblem so like perfect video game maybe um i don't know i'll see how i feel about it it definitely has it has a lot of me written all over it so i'm mm. definitely interested in the unicorn overlord um and then i really want to check out um i bought fantasy life the original on 3ds and uh the follow-up fantasy life i also looks delightful um and i feel like it has big stardew energy that series generally so like that's a new game fantasy life I. yes okay. it is it's basically a sequel to the original fantasy life um so yeah it's uh it's looking cute and adorable and great and yeah i i really want to play the first one um so that i can eventually get to that um but yeah that, that looks really good and i think the last interesting thing is that the kind of one more thing final announcement was a nintendo switch online update um where they were basically like hey here's a bunch of rare games coming to uh switch online so included uh rc pro-am uh snake rat and rattle and roll and um uh battle toads is there as well i think battle toads uh, and then there was one more that is, is escaping me but um blast core was the n64 game uh which yeah, I mean, that's an interesting throwback, that game. I have heard a lot of people talk about Blast Core. Uh, I've never 
really played it myself or really know too much about it um definitely one that i would like to check out at some point and i don't know did you ever hear or see anything about blast core bally um uh, i've forgotten now i've heard about blast core i just cannot yeah to the life of me remember what that looks like or you're even... basically it's basically like you're in a city and like destroying buildings and like there's vehicles and stuff like that oh, right, right um but yeah it, it has uh it has a lot of uh n64 energy uh feels like it did belong on that platform so talking um, of n64 energy uh-huh um nintendo and they've got some deal with disney clearly but star wars battlefront coming to switch oh right yeah um i feel like every single star wars game in the noughties that is not a factor five star wars game is now on the switch yeah like it's incredible the number of games that they've got on the switch now and my frustration is i want to play rogue squadron i want to play battle for naboo i want to play the like the factor five you know like dogfight games mm-hmm. uh, on my switch and i'm guessing that the rights for those games is more complicated than it should be and mm. those games can't make it because like those are the games i feel nostalgic about and want to play so it's really a shame that star wars battlefront which was always like the cool star wars game that the playstation kids had uh-huh that yeah. we would never play because we had no. nintendo i guess you had playstation one but i guess battlefront was playstation 2 wasn't it so. i played a good amount of battlefront at people's houses uh, i did right. i did play a good amount of battlefront 2 especially that was really cool like just lightsabers on battlefields and shooting and all these locations and that trailer even in the switch in this um part of the showcase like kit, kit fisto and uh, yeah name drop kit name fisto. dropping all all our all the classics all our favorite jedi it's like they, and seeing this shot of like naboo i was like that is really cool but also i wish i'd kind of grown up with that game maybe rather than play that game now i don't know yeah, we were uh, chatting about uh, Kit Fisto in our Slack, and I was like, shout out to Kit Fisto, survive seven seconds against Palpatine. <laughs> what a <laughs> yes. dude. So, uh, um, yeah. But, like, is that game going to have full online support and stuff? I think like, so, yeah. Really? I think it, it, I think, I don't think it can work otherwise, right? Because it was a multiplayer game first and foremost, really. Okay. Um, so. Does it have, like, a single-player campaign as well? I think it probably does, okay. yeah. Though I don't remember much about it, yeah. but... Um, but yeah, the Battlefront games were, you know, the, the, I guess they were like after the GoldenEye generation. Like, I think feel like Star Wars Battlefront in the PS2 era was like, that was what people played at friends' houses, right? Like, I think yeah. it was the multiplayer shooter that took over a lot of uh, a lot of that generation. So um, yeah, it's very cool to see it come back. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's that's great. I just um, wish for the Factor 5 games. But... Yeah, one day. I'm sure oh, they'll figure it out. Oh, well. They'll figure it out eventually. Yeah. Um, yeah, a couple of other weird ones in here. Uh, they're uh, bringing Pocket Card Jockey back, which is nice to see. Um, and that's a port. Yeah, I think so. It's called Ride On, so I actually am not sure. Um, I can't. I think it might be. A, it might be a new game. It might be a new Pocket Card Jockey. I uh, heard it was a port of the Apple Arcade game. Oh, weird. Right. Um, okay. So the Apple Arcade game I think came out one or two years ago, and then Got this you. is that game. Okay, which was a different game, but it is not the original Pocket Card Jockey on right. 3DS. Yeah um i was trying to figure out what the fuck shin megami tensei 5 vengeance is because atlas are always weird and they do this thing where they have like 17 versions of all their franchises like it's not just persona that does this smt does it as well apparently vengeance is original smt5 with more stuff added so it's essentially like the persona 5 royal for smt5 is kind of what this is um but yeah i just every time stuff like that pops up i'm always like is this like a standalone game on its own or do you have to have played the first smt5 or when when yeah. are you jumping into smt that's what i don't i to honestly know. don't think ever if if i'm wow. gonna be brutally honest about it <laughs> and the reason for that is i have never cared about combat in the persona games i play all those games on easy because i don't like the difficulty of the combat in those games and i just want to do the social stuff smt is a series where it's so focused on the combat and not on the story and I don't like the combat of SMT games. So I just don't like all it is, is the combat really like there's such a little, I mean, there is story focus obviously, but it's not the same story focus that persona has. I just never see myself getting into SMT. If I'm going to be brutally honest about it. Um, 
maybe one day i did i think i bought one of them on 3ds because of course i did just to keep my options open because one day i might change but um but yeah i I just don't see myself doing it but you've got enough dragon quest and final fantasies to still exactly right i gotta i gotta clear all those um and monster hunter stories apparently another rpg series that is slowly emerging um Mm. which they they are now bringing the original to switch which is cool so you can now play one and two on switch and you know hopefully this continues to happen where 3ds games that were stranded and are now not purchasable anymore do finally make their way to other platforms so that's good um but yeah i think uh, i think that's pretty much most things and mother uh, three in japan yeah of course everyone's been talking about it nintendo putting mother three on the japanese switch online and um uh, I just I don't think we're ever going to get this video game. I think I have fully given up hope, Bally, that this will ever be officially localized Me by too. Nintendo. Me too. Um, and you know, hey, maybe one day down the line we'll be surprised. But I just I I've given up. I think most people have at this point. It's like, what's the point uh, in even wishing for something to happen uh, with that game anymore? I just it just doesn't make any sense. I think. And I think they've decided, yeah. like, regardless of translation, because anyone can translate a game. Surely right. that's not the difficult part. They've just decided culturally and supposedly there are a few cultural things in there that they think might be i think there's a lot there's a lot of inappropriate not great stuff inappropriate and we all know that games between japan and the rest of the world are often edited in different ways and Mm -hmm. and i think they've made a decision that you know it's not something in that game that they think isn't suitable to a western audience and think it works for a japanese one and so be it (laughs) yeah that's it that's it uh we'll never get mother three uh and uh hey maybe uh maybe we if only we had out. enough games to play that's yeah. the problem because yeah. you're running out of games to play yeah look one day bali i'll i'll make one of those uh, emulation handhelds and set it all up for you with every single Excellent. game that you want to play that's, and what, just, that's what i need that's and then give it to you and then you just play all those games there we go uh, i'll have a so. good time yeah um uh, but yeah overall a, a cool partner showcase definitely i think more than i was expecting given what people were uh bracing for which was like yeah probably those xbox games plus a bunch of stuff to fill out the year and it's kind of what we got but i think the stuff to fill out the year is at least at least like interesting mm. right epic mickey another monkey ball like stuff coming back from the dead like endless ocean like some deep cuts here that i thought yeah. was was fun it's cool it's cool uh, and I'm very excited to try out like uh, uh, Penny's Big Breakaway. I really yes. want to see some reviews on that. And definitely check out the Pepper Grinded demo as well. Yes, that was I played that. Was that. Also shadow dropped. Yeah, I played that over Steam Next Fest. The Pepper Grinded demo. You had a good um, time with the demo. Yeah, it was really good. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, it's very short. It's only 15 minutes long. So um, yeah, you can you can bang through it. And uh, yeah, it, I think it's uh, it's going to be a cool game. That game. Um, so looking forward to that when it comes out. Uh, but I think that is going to do us for this week's episode. I have a random question linked to the board. All right. Right. Okay, is go the for Tucky it. Squire coming to Switch? It is, yeah. It's announced it for Switch. Um, okay. I don't know when that's coming out, but it's supposed to be this year at some point. Yeah, it's supposed so, to be this year. So we'll yeah. see. But it didn't show up in something like this. That's why I'm... But no. I guess um, Pepper Grinders there window game for yeah this window or whatever so. yeah right because devolver does both of those um so that makes yeah, sense yeah. um yeah uh, again no hollow knight i don't think anyone was expecting it but uh, <laughs> continues continues to, <laughs> to be mia i tell you they're saving that for the launch of the switch too that's what that game when that game's coming out oh well it means they'll have to delay it into 2025 then won't they uh, yeah so. well they delayed rayman way back with the wii u do you remember that right yes yeah um, so now Very nintendo's true. gonna get its revenge yeah that's true that makes sense have um, that good stuff well that is going to do us uh, for today's show. Thanks to you so much, everybody, for listening. Um, you can go to different places on the internet to find us, such as patreon.com slash this Nintendo life, where you can support us directly. Uh, and uh, you can go and get bonus episodes and fun stuff. And Bali, we'd like to thank some of our patrons. Yes, thank you to our $10 tier plus patrons. They are Zach S., Thomas, Matthew, Albert, Wicked Gamer, UK, Alan, Turtle, and Ali T. And Ali T. Um, uh, and we should say we uh, bonus bits so that's our two dollar tier we did a, an interesting podcast um talking about some of the ins and outs of launching Bal- balatro yes uh, so definitely go on over there if you want to hear yeah. mbz say a few a few mm-hmm. things about that yeah uh and yeah shout out to ali t I, I sent him a code for the game and uh he started playing it so 
I'll see. I'll get his thoughts soon. I'm sure, and uh, okay. figure out what he's uh, been thinking about it. But um, yeah, uh, go ahead and check it out. You can go and buy it. It's on Nintendo Switch. Go buy it on Switch. It's fun. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> Use everyone it else screen. is. It's everyone else is apparently. Everyone else so is playing it. Look, you're going to be left out of the cool people club if you don't play it. Frankly, so uh, you've got to go do it. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, you can obviously find us around the internet in various places. Um, find me on Twitter at Lord NBZ, also on Threads and on Blue Sky at NBZ. Bally, where can they find you? I'm on Twitter at Ballyman91. That's B A L Y M A N 91. And that's also my name on Blue Sky. Lovely. Uh, you can obviously follow the podcast as well at TNL Podcast to get updates on the show, what we're doing, all that good stuff. Um, and yeah, you can find us in various places across the internet. You can download the podcast uh, from any podcasting app that you so happen to use. Uh, and also just places like i don't know apple podcasts and spotify and all that jazz uh go find us subscribe and uh yeah it'll be a, a good fun time and uh yeah i think that is going to do us um bali i have gone so little sleep over the last week so i oh, think man. i'm gonna go straight to bed uh after Sounds this good. and hopefully uh sleep for like 20 well, hours so we're preparing for a house move mm. so <laughs> Fingers crossed yes. everything goes to plan, but that's Definitely. something that's going to take up a lot of me and Caroline's time um, yeah. in the next couple of weeks. So. Absolutely. Well, best of luck on Wish that. Luck. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure we'll uh, be uh, excited to hear your thoughts from the new place whenever yeah. that happens. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll uh, I'm sure be uh, checking in. But um, until then, uh, we are going to get out of here. Um, and we'll be back in a couple of weeks' time with some more Nintendo and some more podcasting. Thanks for listening. I'll see you soon. Bye bye. interlude used on today's show was the main theme from Balatro. Copyright Louis F. and Local Thunk, 2024.